two, three. Testing one. to hit the button so i guess we're starting without the 30 seconds yay <laughs> that's how we do it sometimes uh hello welcome good morning everyone to another episode of cloud chats episode 15 on may 27th 2021 titled conferences improving performance and a new host I should pull my mic to where it needs to be um so this is i am mason and these are my hosts chris matt and kim the new one and i pointed in the wrong direction wrong again one day no it's not gonna you'll get it right one week no i won't <laughs> i give up matt right. what, what we're gonna do now is matt's gonna point and we're just gonna imagine that he pointed in the <laughs> right direction no we'll have practice sessions if we need it oh my god you'll goodness. get it right one day no i won't <laughs> I, I won't uh how's everyone doing this morning yeah, uh, good. How's my mic? Fine. Sounds good. You sound good. good. Cool. You sounded good when you did testing as well. Yeah. <laughs> it's gonna I be forever. I didn't go through, didn't I? No, it goes through. Well, that's why it mic. That's why it mutes us during the during the the pre thing because you can you can you can actually talk over it, which is a cool feature. Maybe we should like take advantage of sometime. I thought if my face wasn't in the thing though, it wouldn't play. No, they added nope. the new feature now where you can unmute yourself while a, an, an external media is playing so you can talk over it. So you can kind of do like voiceovers on video now. It's kind of cool. It's like a, one of their newer feature. Well, good to know. Um... <laughs> yeah, I guess we're going to start off with our hello world question today. And today we decided let's be spicy. Um, <laughs> so the question today is, and how can we add this, Matt? Let's add it as a banner real quick. The question today sure. is... Are you a tabs person or are you a spaces person? So it's it's not a complicated question. It's not tabs or spaces. And if spaces, how many spaces? Yes, <laughs> that's a that's a big one. So, so tabs uh, versus spaces, answer in the chat. What are we doing? We will introduce a, we will introduce Kim in a second. Brian, we're doing something. <laughs> it's like we have a plan. <laughs> so yeah, don't worry, Brian. You'll get to meet Kim pretty to, soon. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna do a whole whole little section on it. So yeah, we're gonna rip off it. We're gonna rip off a TV show in the process. So I mean, no. So <laughs> ah, okay. So Toon Army Captain says spaces. We Stop. We got some. Here we go. We started the flame war. Tabs or spaces? This is what I. This is what I'm here for. Some men just want to watch the world burn with tabs <laughs> and spaces. Okay. So Toon Army Captain, how many spaces? Two. How or many four, spaces? Or three. Three, Ooh, three. <laughs> That's th th those are the people that just want to watch the world. Burn. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's start off with us. While before we wait, like, while we wait for people to fill in, so we can kind of maybe take a we'll count. Yeah. Matt, tabs or spaces? Uh, so spaces all the way, uh, and then two versus four depends on what language I'm working in. So Python, I do four. <laughs> JavaScript, I do two. That makes sense. Yeah, I, I, I usually, I guess if I'm doing something brand new, I go with like my default is four. But if I open a file and it's at two, then I will go with whatever the like the, the file has yeah. already set up. I'm not one of those people that goes in and changes everything in PR, use tabs or not spaces uh, kind of well, people. Because this is why your project should have like an editor config file or even link have a link to set to just enforce it. So I guess we could. There. Last week you showed us those Git hooks. Uh, we okay, could have fine. next week. We'll do like a really quick intro into edit editor configs so that. Oh, no, I was just it. saying, just use the git hook just to change it all the time, <laughs> <laughs> just automatically do it. Yeah, automatically mm. change it. Chris, tabs or spaces? Um, well, I see a lot of tabs in chat from Benjamin, <laughs> Brittany, Polina in chat has tabs as well. 
Um, Don't let you know, chat influence you. <laughs> it's making me think back though, because when, when I first started, like whatever, I think it's whatever editor you're using, and they're like, oh, well, tabs and four it is. Then that's kind mm -hmm. of, I don't think many people like adjust that setting, right? So I like, isn't VS Code still defaulting to four? Yes, um, yes, four spaces. Four spaces or, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So I think it depends because when I started, the editor was like, "Hey, here's a tab, and it's this giant thing." Uh, so I did that for a while until somebody, you know, yells at me and told me I was. I, I like this fact from Sam. Found a random article from 2017 that says developers who use spaces make more money than those who use tabs. And I would like to think it's true. Uh, that sounds like an Onion article, but honestly, it wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> I mean, it, it makes sense. Uh, through my career, the, the longer I got in my career, the more I used spaces and the more money I made throughout my career. <laughs> I don't know if that's correlation. Kim, what about you? Tabs or spaces? I use tabs, um, but this is one of those debates in tech where when it comes up, I sort of slink to the other side of the room. Um. <laughs> well, you're the chat. The chat's got your back today. We're yeah. the, we're the mi we're the minority in this. I'm one, surprised right? by chat. Yeah, I am too. Most people don't say tabs, but hey, maybe so. being like intentionally controversial. <laughs> So I, I was beat in, I used to use tabs at the very beginning, but then when I went to university, I had a professor that I graded for who was the most anti-tab person on earth because she's like, well, if you do tabs and you set it to three spaces and I set it to seven, it looks different. And I'm like, why are you setting your tabs to seven? But anyway, I wound up just doing, you know, tabs, two spaces. I still use the mm -hmm. tab key, but it just inserts four spaces. Mm -hmm. um, yes. As a Python person, the, the, the py Python itself refers, prefers spaces. Um, I, ooh, I don't remember what that pep is. Pep A? I think that's the style guide. Pep yeah. A's the yeah. But what's pep third? I don't know. Either way, I think that is. Yeah, I think I'm pretty sure it's pep eight. I'm thinking of a different one, but um basically all of we also have to remember that all of Python's style guide is a suggestion. Yeah. It's like you could do this, which I which I don't like. If you're gonna have a style guide, have a style guide, don't have a suggestion yeah, guide. Make it opinionated, yeah. Yes, Got like it. which is which is why the, the Python tool black is gained in popularity. Because this one person decided that this is how we're gonna format Python, and you run this tool and it formats the Python for you. And everyone was like, Wow, that sounds way better than writing clean code in the first place. We'll just use a tool for it. <laughs> which is what um prettier does in the JavaScript world. It's like very little config. <laughs> Just this is how your your code's going to be formatted and deal with it, which like honestly is like more to me is more important than whether it's two spaces, four spaces, or a tab. It's just consistency. I don't want my diff to have a load of white space changes in it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's that. Those are the petty diffs. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's saying that. That's why I don't like tabs because when you're looking at a diff in like GitHub or whatever, tabs generally make a diff far like wider than it needs to be yeah it does and it makes just ugh. well wow. well no one else has any more opinions to drop into chat real quick what do we have anyone else have a tabs versus spaces are we just are we so tired of this conversation that we don't want to fight we don't want to fight it anymore i don't know there's a good few tabs in here uh oh tsunami caption replied uh fourth python two for yaml okay that makes sense. I can see that, which is funny because isn't YAML like, I don't know. I always, YAML is space sensitive, right? Yes. I think so. Yeah. Yes. YAML is disastrous, <laughs> but also like lovely. It's hilarious that like, I used to like YAML and then I, after like one day, one really bad day of fighting with YAML, I was just like, screw it. I'm using JSON from now on. And, uh, how do you type? Okay, Toon Army. Okay, troll. But yeah, how do you type tabs on a mobile device? <laughs> um, you know, there are these. This these younger kiddos are definitely programming with well, one. I could not imagine having to program on a with my thumbs. Um, it would drive me up a wall. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. Like, you can't type tabs on a, on a. You say you can't type tabs, but typing a load of spaces on a mobile device is also a pain because it'll insert a period for you automatically. Mm. Oh, <laughs> you're right. Don't program on mobile devices, kids. Get a keyboard. <laughs> oh, that was good. I like that. That is good. Well, yeah. And now we'll move over to Have You Met Kim? I got it. I got it. Well I got it. Yes. <laughs> so as you may have noticed, we have a new person here today. Kim. Hello. Hello. Hi. I'm good. How are you? <laughs> good. 
well, hey everyone, my name is Kim Schlesinger. I'm a new developer advocate at DigitalOcean and I'll be working closely with Chris and Mason and uh, I'll be focusing a lot on cloud native technologies. Um, so we were thinking like what what kind of introductory section could we do uh, for me to tell you a little bit more about myself? And I'm just gonna tell you about how I got into the tech industry. So I work at DigitalOcean now. My job right before DigitalOcean is I was a site reliability engineer at a small company called Fairwinds um, that does a lot of work with Kubernetes enablement and Kubernetes open source software. And I worked a lot with Kubernetes. I set up clusters for customers, um, helped them set up CI CD pipelines, deploy applications into their clusters, um, and then helped uh, maintain the clusters. So I got to see a lot of Kubernetes, work with a lot of Kubernetes, um, and it was good. And I spent more time with YAML than I did with anything else in that job doing configuration, which was interesting. Um, but um, to start from like the beginning of my career, I wasn't a tech person um, always. Um, after I graduated college, I taught um, primary school music uh, here in the US. And then after doing that for a couple of years, I switched to teach uh, special education. So worked with kids who had learning disabilities. Um, and in 2014, I decided it was time to leave the classroom. It was a really challenging job. Uh, and I didn't see a way to sustainably do that for the rest of my career. I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, I was hanging out in Boulder, Colorado, and after applying for a lot of jobs and not getting any calls back and considering going back to school, I have a master's degree in special education, but I was considering getting another master's degree to build my skill set. Someone said, hey, have you heard of these coding boot camps? Um, you should check them out. So I'd never heard of them. I'd never considered coding. Um, I liked computers when I was a kid, but I never got into gaming or anything that that like pulled me into looking deep more deeply into code. So I looked into the boot camp, did some try JavaScript um, tutorials, and really enjoyed it. And went to the boot camp, um, learned front end and back end JavaScript. Um, uh, used a lot of Scotch tutorials because I was uh, learning things in the MERN <laughs> stack. So thank you, Chris. Um, and um, I guess one thing I didn't mention is that um, toward the end of my teaching career, I became an instructional coach and teacher trainer. So I was teaching teachers about best practices and how to interact with their students and improve their teaching skills. Um, and I love that job. And I actually ended up doing that job, instructional coaching at the boot camp that I went to um, and then moved into a more technical role. And then uh, when I was teaching at the boot camp, I really loved helping students debug deployment issues. And so in my mind, I was like, I should think about DevOps maybe. I think that might be a part of the tech industry that I and more naturally inclined um, to participate in. So that's why I switched into the DevOps job. And here I am, I'm so excited for this job because I get to combine all of the parts of my careers before. So um, that is the condensed version of me, Kim. <laughs> that was great. That is amazing. I love that. As Team Army Captain, you have you have you have now qualified for double sainthood. So, <laughs> double sainthood. Um, but so that's pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sounds it like... sounds like it's right. This this job's like a really good mix of like the tech side of things and also the education side of things. So yeah. Yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> Do you have any debugging questions? I love that. <laughs> yeah, um, debugging deployments. <laughs> in your bootcamp was Mern. Like, was there a big focus on any backend or server side stuff, or is it mostly like full stack front end scenario? I think it was pretty evenly split between like front end stuff and back end stuff. We learned Node and Express and um, built a lot of APIs um, and focused a lot on that, actually. I think I'm more naturally inclined toward back end stuff. Um, and so maybe I'm, I'm remembering that with that that perspective, um, but I would say it was like relatively evenly split. Um, cool. Um, any database work in your bootcamp? We, uh, we, we did Node actually. And um, when I joined the education team at the bootcamp, um, we decided that we wanted to 
make Node more optional and teach uh, people Postgres so that they could learn relational databases and SQL, um, just to have that be part of their foundation. Um, like Mongo, oh, I think I said Node, I meant Mongo. Yeah, we learned uh, non-relational databases, um, mm -hmm. but that was nice and easy uh, and fast, um, but we decided yeah. students needed that uh, SQL experience. So. That's cool. That, that's great to hear. I think one of the classes that I loved the most and learned the most from was database like architecture. I think they don't teach that enough these days. Did they? Yeah. That was interesting because that was one of my least favorite courses because, but that is me. It, it, like, well, we didn't actually talk about like, you know, we spent like one week on how to actually use a database and the rest of it was, this is what a B plus tree is. And I'm like, I'm never going to implement my own database. Why do I need that? We so, were all about normalization and just like tables, relationships and stuff like that. I see. I see. Yeah, I got like two weeks of that and the rest of it. Because it was being taught by a, pro a professor who was like really big in like database research and stuff. So he wanted to talk about his research, which is cool, mm -hmm. completely impractical. Um, <laughs> to this day, never did anything with it, but still got an A in the class. So I was happy. <laughs> there you go. Um, questions from chat. We have Samantha with. Kim, what was your favorite musical instrument to play or teach? Favorite musical instrument to play or teach? So in college, I played saxophone. Um, so that was like the instrument I was best at, most familiar with. Um, when I taught elementary school music, though, I, I taught younger kids. So we had like those very small uh, marimbas. They're called ORF instruments and recorders. Um, and um, I think that was my favorite was having kids play um, like those small instruments. <laughs> so. Orf instruments are cool. I, I did a little bit of music education while I was like getting my music. Uh, Kim and I bonded over. We both did music. Ed. It's true. <laughs> um, so uh, I love the Orf instruments and all that. that. That's such a fun way to teach. Yeah, it's a fun way to teach. Uh, the thing I really appreciated about being a music educator is that when you teach music, like the students do the thing immediately, basically. Like it's not theoretical. Like, let me teach you about the theory of this instrument or uh, just music theory in general. It's like, let me teach you how to hold the mallets and then let's go. Um, so yeah. those hit, are my hit, favorite things to teach. Hit thing here, get noise. Like it works <laughs> yeah. really well for young children. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have, um, we have another question in chat. Uh, was it difficult to shift from teaching to tech and how are you received in the tech industry? That's a great question. Um, honestly, the shift between teaching and tech was massive. Um, and it's something I didn't fully appreciate at the time when I was in the boot camp. Um, I was just going through a big personal transformation career wise, but also like how I approach the world. Um, and so thinking like a technologist, like taking large problems and breaking them down into their component parts and like, being willing to be like hacky about things, um, those were not like natural to me. Um, and so that took me like four or five years to really feel like, okay, I'm in the tech industry now. Um, so that was a huge shift. And when I talk to people who are at boot camps, I try to emphasize like, this is a big transformation you're going through. Um, it's gonna take more than six months and that's totally fine. Um, how was I received in tech? I think one thing I didn't expect was how valuable my experiences in education were going to be. Um, like whether it's a really explicit link, like in this role where I'm going to do some teaching or run workshops or write tutorials. That's like one obvious way. But even in my last job where I didn't do any education explicitly as part of my role, like knowing how to communicate, knowing how you learn, how other people learn, like writing good docs, drawing good diagrams. Um, I think uh, I've provided a lot of value to uh, my teammates and companies that I've worked at um, because of my background. Um, that being said, like, because I have another career and I'm relatively new in tech, it's sometimes it's hard for me to be like, to be like, I'm, you know, I'm in my mid thirties, but I'm still newish in, in this career. So um, sometimes I struggle with that. It's awesome. Yeah. Oh, that's uh, 
Got which database to use when your requirements are flexible? I would say the one that you know. Yes. Right? The one, the one that you know. Yeah. <laughs> if your requirements are flexible and you don't need a database for a specific reason, use the one that you know because you're least likely to make mistakes on it. Yeah. Uh, and then Toon Army Captain asks, how do I convince my wife to switch from teaching to tech? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a decision for her. Um, but um, I know a lot of former teachers who are now in tech. Um, and so finding those people, whether it's this live stream or finding blog posts. Um, and then, you know, tech is a lucrative field, especially compared to teaching in the US. Um, but um, that person has to want to do it. So if she wants to try some learn coding tutorials or, or play around um, with you while you're working on something like invite her in to do that. <laughs> yeah. I think Just another fun, way, another fun way would be maybe uh, have your wife try to teach tech in the classroom. Like, I don't know what subject they teach or something, but try to incorporate tech that way to see if they like it, if they like it, maybe they'll naturally gravitate toward it, or maybe they'll just become an amazing tech teacher at a public school, which we need more of to begin with. So yeah. definitely. Yeah. I, we need more education in tech across the board, like every level. Let's get more nerds in here. We do. We do. I do. <laughs> I'm, I'm such a big proponent of tech in like early child, like, like early childhood develop like like second you could you could do scratch as early as like second grade easily oh, sure. and like start teaching logical skills and stuff but that is a rabbit hole that i'm not going to jump down yep. because we will we will sit here for hours <laughs> and talk about it we I, could literally just say, have well go ahead chris yeah last thing is like i i had a couple links sent to me yesterday about like uh, younger kids and monthly kits they could get that like was oh, fun yeah. coding kits and it's like i'm so happy this section exists in the market like it's so cool i don't know it is cool they, they, like these robots. yeah those little like f like i want to buy them like they they have some for adults where like you build like a little trebuchet every month and i'm like i want it i know <laughs> i'm i've considered subscribing to one of those kits for myself <laughs> <sighs> trebuchet now we know you're watching game of thrones <laughs> I've got to beat. I've got to beat my 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 HBO Go subscription before it's right. <laughs> uh, okay, Chris, do we have the agenda today? In um, we do. It's pretty. It's got three things on it. So we're gonna go through some news, and I know I'm. I should put this on screen. So let me set up. Yeah, so it'll be a fun agenda today. I think we have some good news items, too. Um, so we're going through. One is the news. Check out our slides, everybody. Two, true or false. And uh, Mason, what's the... Ah, in honor of Kim joining us, it is CNCF themed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Ooh, it's going to be fun. <laughs> and of course, back in my day. Yep. Where we and then what you know what's on our what's on your mind and then a terrible joke and we'll be good. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be fun. Mason's terrible joke. That's, I'm glad that we call it <laughs> of the day. All right, that's our agenda. There you go. There's the agenda. Awesome. So everyone knows what we're doing. Yeah, and now you can also see in the top I can stop. that hand corner that nice. we now tell you. Shush, Matt. <laughs> You're getting better. <laughs> I don't need this sass, Matt. <laughs> okay, well, without any further ado, let's move into the news. So, Chris, I will be, Chris will be displaying it. So, News Flash, it's our wonderful section where we talk about the latest things happening in tech news. Lots of fun things, short amounts of time. So, when you hear our magical little laser sound, it means that we're moving on to the next one. And our first tech piece of news comes out of the land of where the internet is, which is all the tubes. I had a director in high school, used to, or band director in college, used to be like, it's in the tubes. HA Proxy 2.4 has been released. Uh, if you're unaware of HA Proxy, it is an open source, high availability load balancer and proxying server for TCP and HTTP based applications. Um, I've seen this application deployed at a lot of places, a very popular open source tool. Um, version 2.4 is out, which brings with us HTTP2 WebSockets, built-in open tracing. That's really mm, cool. That's very um, cool. DNS TCP resolution, which I'm assuming means that we're gearing up for DNSSEC, correct? Like, because DNSSEC is over TCP, right, Matt? Presumably. 
I, I think know. it's I pretty think similar it about what their intentions are. Yeah, and then dynamic SSL certificate storage. So there's a lot of really cool releases in HA Proxy 2.4. Yeah, I don't know, the one that stood out to me was WebSockets. They're always cool. I'm a fan of WebSockets in every situation, um, and the fact that now they can essentially load balance WebSockets is it's a nice that is thing. Really to have. cool. Yeah. Kim, have you ever worked with HA Proxy? It's it's pretty big in the cloud native space. I haven't. I think I've worked exclusively with Nginx. Um, okay. But to have open tracing built in is amazing because then you yeah. can watch the trace like go through uh, HA Proxy, which is nice to not have to do yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, I'm really excited for that. Well, our next one comes out of the land of I'll fix that bug eventually. <laughs> After 21 years. A bug has been fixed in, fixed in Firefox on Mac OS X. Something to do with native context menus. I don't understand how browsers and context menus and stuff Mac work. But the fun fact is, is that if you've got a bug that's been sitting in your backlog for a long time, it's not if it, it can still be fixed, even yep. if it's 21 years later. Reporter, 21 years. There is somewhere in this thread a comment saying, uh, it, it's not a technical challenge here. It's just a time issue. And that was like one of the first responses somewhere in this thread. And lo and behold, 21 years later, there you go. it's a time thing. <laughs> 21 well, years later, they fixed it. That is... I'm going to add this to all of my uh, usernames. Not reading bug mail. And also rarely reading... Oh, is this automated? Maybe. It might be. Yeah. I don't know. Um, but yeah, um, the context behind this is when like... If you select a bit of text and then right click, um, Firefox sets what items show up here. So you don't get look up, uh, for example. Um, and at last, they're switching back to actually just using the native context menu. So you'll get things like look up. Hmm. 21 years. 21 years. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You know what? So for everyone that's like, oh, it's too late. No one cares about that bug anymore. This story's for you. That yeah. means that and this is, is why you should, if you haven't got time to fix a bug now, you should just leave the issue open because yeah. you might be able to come back to it later. <sighs> yeah. Okay. Well, our next story comes out of the land of large elephants. <laughs> Postgres 14 beta one has been released and it's got some pretty interesting things coming up with it. Apparently they're observing a 50% performance improvement over Postgres 13. That's a wow. non-trivial number. <laughs> Yeah, so um, this, that, that number came out of uh, a couple of, I'm going to say bloggers, really not the right word in the tech industry, but a couple of bloggers that were testing the beta uh, using PG Bench, and they saw like upwards of 50% improvements. Um, does it say what their test was? Uh, it's not in this article, I don't think. It was in a different one I saw, but it's just running the PG Bench um, command line tool, okay. which it just hammers Postgres, basically. <laughs> 50% in performance improvement. That is, that's, you know, this is not the first like announcement that we've done on this show of like new things coming out. Like didn't like Node or like the new Node.js also like tout some like 30% increase. Like all these things are getting amazing performance increases lately. Yeah. Um, but, uh, there's one right at the end we'll talk about in, in the what's on, my, on your mind section. Um, JavaScript bundling has had some really major improvements in performance recently as well. That's awesome. I'm glad that I'm glad that the internet's getting faster, not slower, because it kind of yeah. looked like it was going the other way for a while. <laughs> <laughs> There's still some gnarly parts of it. <laughs> hey, I still make people load like a 256 megabyte image when they go to my blog page, which I just haven't had the time to minimize. So 10,000 pixels on a 3,300 pixel screen. <laughs> yep, exactly. Exactly. We're going to get it's going to be beautiful in the in its HD in this. Uh, the next thing comes out of designs that I don't care for too much. Um, no. <laughs> I was never a fan of material. Um, I really didn't like material design. I'm not a designer, so don't hire Mason to be a designer. But apparently Google has released Material U, which looks like it's just the next generation of material, which came, material came out in 2014. Um, and I remember that brief period when everything was material. Yeah. And I didn't like it. Um, so what's different between material and material U, Matt? I don't know. I didn't add this one. Chris, do you Chris, know what's material different? Uh, I did add it, but I just did it to like make fun of it, really, because... Oh, okay. Okay, okay well, fine. Yeah. We're making fun of things. Good. Go ahead. No, it's not that. I just... The promise... 
like it's cool interaction, all that fun stuff. But like, it's never been for me 60 frames per second. Like it's never been performant material design. Mm -hmm. I feel like they should have solved that first before they went into. Music. Well, you, it, it you solved so the friendly and squishy. Yeah, like, you. Yeah, whenever you, whenever you can, bit. when you control the speed of your own gifts, of course it is. <laughs> I don't know, man. So I can't squishy. even go into Gmail and click on a like a checkbox without it lagging. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I it, there's a place in the world for material, but yeah, I'm not a fan of it with my stuff either. Good. I'm glad I'm not the only one. Uh, I don't know. I I've I don't like the minimalist movement in in art space. I like I like Kim studied music also, so like I hated minimalism. I think it's like the dumbest thing that ever happened to music. I loathe it. Like just resolve your chords, please. Um, <laughs> so just resolve. Like that's all you have to do. It's not that hard. I figured it out 700 years ago. So minimalist stuff. I like minimalist code and that's the only thing I like minimalist. Everything else uh -oh. needs to look pretty. So I'm I don't a know, like... big fan of minimalist composers and my very first portfolio <laughs> website I built with a material, um, like templates <laughs> so 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 kim and i are polar opposites <laughs> uh toon army captain says the sass is thick today i like it uh it happens it happens it happens i mean like it depends on the i will say item. i will say to, to google's credit right uh it looks nice mm -hmm. okay whether, it, yeah. whether the interactions about it or not it looks nice yeah it does look nice <laughs> I still have to learn Tailwind. I'll do this after Tailwind. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Like every... The other part of it, I'll just keep going, is that material design has like these great component libraries and everyone's like, you know what, I'm going to reach for that component library and it's used so much that now there's a ton of sites that are kind of slow. Mm -hmm. And not to the engineer, like not to the developer's like fault. Yeah. Yeah, I remember whenever I first started doing front end stuff, Bootstrap had just come on the scene, oh, and I used Bootstrap. I remember, I remember that time in the world. <laughs> um, and I made some pretty horrific. I mean, I liked it. It was interesting. I this is like I I copied and pasted until I got things to look the way I did. I never actually learned how to do front end design, and it's on my list of things to do. Um, that list grows longer every day. <sighs> Our next story is out of the land of text editors. Fun place to be. Um, mm -hmm. Sublime Text 4 has been released with native Apple Silicon support. I'm getting a little bit tired of always having our releases always native Apple Silicon. I mean, I get it, but still. It's a boring, it's a boring refrain that I'm getting tired of. Um, but it looks like they've added like a lot of cool stuff. They've rewritten the engine to for like suggestions on autocomplete. Um yeah, I you know, I never got into Sublime. Have any of y'all ever used Sublime? Like, uh, exclusively for like my first six or seven years. Coach. Really? Okay. Yeah. See, my first I, as well. Okay, because like I I programmed in I don't know like when I started learning programming I used JCreator for Java but then once ever I was out of that like I used Eclipse for a semester of C plus plus and then I've exclusively programmed in Vim up until 2019. I spent okay. the first, uh, yeah, like I, I decided, hey, I'm going to give VS Code a shot because I was starting to learn Go. Um, and like I did it and I like it now and now I use VS Code, but I almost programmed exclusively in Vim for like the first 10 years of my career or, or since I've been programming. Yeah, I started um, writing code in 2015 and Adam had just come out and, so I, and it was free. So I was using Adam and I think yeah, that was like uh, replacing Sublime as the the hotness. <laughs> yeah. Isn't VS Code based off of Sublime? Am I am I imagining? Sublime's no, not even no. open source, is it? It's, no, it's uh, completely closed source. You're thinking of like the link between VS Code and Atom, which is that both Electron. Yeah. OK. OK. Well, I learned and something. Both like they're both now maintained by GitHub because Microsoft is GitHub, which is VS Code. I don't know. Yeah, they are still putting out Atom stuff, huh? Oh, are they? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Atom still gets updates, and it's like, I don't know, I see Atom nowadays as just a plain text editor. <sighs> Toon Army Captain's baiting us. Should I learn Vim? <laughs> I use PyCharm. Um, I think if you're already, so one, I think everybody needs to know VI, because at some point you may get dumped into a text terminal, and all you're going to have is VI, and you're mm -hmm. going to be in a, like, so you should at least kind of know how to close it. Um, and other than that, Wait, no, if you're using PyCharm... 
yeah spam control c multiple times <sighs> if you're happy with the tool that you want then use it. I wanted, like, I, I had been in Vim for a very long time, but, like, I never really got really good at Vim key bindings. I got okay with them, but I wanted to get productivity back, and not being able to use a mouse to copy and paste was irritating me, let's be honest. Mm -hmm. um, so I was like, I'm going to try VS Code, and now I love VS Code. Um, I've used PyCharm. I like PyCharm. I like yeah. VS Code because I can do every programming language in it. I have yeah. one environment to rule them all, and that's really what that's why it's got. See, so I'm, the, I'm, I'm the opposite there. I like having all the JetBrains IDEs because I like having an IDE per language, mm. so I can split things out. Why? Why is that? Is that just for like men mentally modeling different languages, or like? Yeah, I think it's it's a bit of like yeah, having that mental separation between like I'm working in a Python project, I'm working in a Node project. Mm. I think also like a lot of my settings differ between the two. And I've never bothered to try and get VS Code to co be configured well enough. <laughs> gotcha. It also, I would say the, the the I've never really gotten the full experience of VS Code by running the code using like the run feature in VS Code. I typically still, I typically just open a terminal at the bottom and still run all of my code in the terminal. Like, so mm -hmm. I get, I've never really like taken hey, advantage of. At least you're using the the integrated terminal. That's still a step forward. Yeah, well, I mean, I everything I do is on the on the Windows subsystem for Linux. So I either use that or I use like my command line tool, like like just like I just get another shell to it. But yeah, they're cool. Te we'll we, we'll do a whole episode on text editors one day because I feel next like week, there you go. next week's cold open. We'll just talk about editors. <laughs> so we cut out half the show because we're gonna spend no, we're gonna spend show. forty minutes. Yeah, whole show. We should we could do a special cloud chats the text editor show. We could. Um, okay, actually, our last news story. <laughs> now, actually, I am too. We should do it. Our yeah. last news story comes out of something that Chris put. Yeah, this is <laughs> Road Sandbox, everybody. Um, what, what do you know? Okay, Chris, Let's go ahead. In. Chris, go ahead. Because I, I did. You added this like last second. I didn't get a chance to look at it. So take yeah. it away, Chris. So Code, Pan Code Sandbox uh, is an online playground for JavaScript type project, just exclusively. But and what's cool is you can run like server side stuff like Node in browser, um, nice. and they just acquired Play.js, which kind of leads into coding on an iPad or iPhone, uh, and I'm sure they have plans for Android as well in the future. But could could you all code mobile? Like if tablets were good enough, could that replace everything? Yeah. If I had a keyboard, if I had a proper keyboard. I loved my Surface Pro. I had a Surface Pro 2 in college. Um, I bought it my last semester. And in reality, if it had been coming out whenever I was a freshman, I should have bought it then because taking digital notes with a pen was the best thing I ever did hmm. for my college career. Mm -hmm. um, I loved it. The keyboard was hot garbage, um, but it worked enough that I could do stuff with it. And I mean, haven't we been saying that, you know, the iPad is basically the MacBook Air now? So, I mean, we're already yeah, there. We're, 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 the we're already there. Um, I would, you know, I remember when tablets were coming out and they were talking about them taking over the industry. Remember, does anyone remember whenever gaming companies were worried that PC gaming was going to die because tablet and phone gaming was going to beat it? Does anyone remember that time in history? I do. It happened for like one day. And then everyone <laughs> went, oh, no, PC games are still a thing. Yeah. Um, I actually would not be against it. As a, as a laptop, I don't think I would ever get rid of a desktop to program on a tablet, mm -hmm. but I would happily trade in a laptop to pro program on a tablet. I don't. I, they're the same thing at that point. I say like, yeah, if I if I traded my MacBook for, let's say, an iPad with a keyboard, I'm not really changing anything. It's like no change has happened. Yeah. <laughs> what about yeah, you, Chris? What would you would you would you give up the Would you give up stuff for a tablet? Like, would you would do you uh, want to program on a tablet? I mean, what are the benefits of it? Just it's like smaller to carry around, right? Like touch screen. Touch screen, which uh, code I don't know. I, I code a lot in GitHub's editor uh, and just push stuff live, but that's living kind of on the edge. Yeah. Wow. Brave. I haven't used their uh code spaces though. Oh I need to. I'm in the beta and I've never done it. Yeah. Is it out of beta now? I no, don't know. It's still in beta, I think. We should but, do we should do a demo of that. Matt, do you have a demo access to that? Uh yes, I do have access to it. 
next we week's lighting tutorial, we should do that. I'll have, I'll have to remember how to use it, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, but no, yeah. It's, it's VS Code in the browser. Yeah. I don't know. Just a touch on point. Like, did you see the new Surface Duo? You know, Microsoft's like flip, flip Android. Oh, they're back uh, into the phone market now, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, with Android. But this is like them playing Xbox on that thing. Because it's two screens. Wow. So one's like the gamepad. Huh. Okay, that's kind of cool. <laughs> kind of cool. Also feels really over over engineered. Like, what was wrong streaming? with just an Xbox controller? <laughs> uh, Dan O'Brien asks, "Can you get into the iPad's terminal and run code locally on the iPad, like Bash scripts and stuff?" That's a good question. <laughs> I know that there are SSH terminals. Like, you can get. Yeah. I don't know if you can get into the actual iPad one, but I mean, I, I think, feel like we're I doubt Apple's get... ever gonna let that happen. Really? Yeah, that kind of. So yeah, I guess you wouldn't. I don't know if you'd be able to run stuff locally, but they may they may eventually come out with an app that's like a sandbox app where it's a sandbox environment. Yeah, I so like sure you could emulate all of Bash and SH in there. Yeah, it's not that hard. So Blink Shell, I've heard of Blink Shell before. Yeah, a pro yeah, terminal for like, iOS. You can SSH into a droplet here and just do all of your work on the droplet. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I need like a picture or something. It's cool. It's Which means it's, it's great, right? Because then. You're not tied to a single device at that point. Mm -hmm. Your development environment is wherever you want it to be. Yeah, I'm surprised. Like Mason uses uh, WSL mm -hmm. and remote, love it. Remote coding through VS Code. Like, have you tried mm -hmm. doing it with a droplet? Yes, my first tutorial that I wrote at DigitalOcean is on that exact thing using using the remote VS Code extension to connect yeah. to a droplet, and it works beautifully. It's a it's a wonderful design. I just don't. I use the WSL. Because I don't always want to have to keep a droplet up and running to do it. I like being able to code locally. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, that's all we have time for the news today. We're only terribly behind schedule. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just but it's fine. We are so it's behind fine. schedule. No, we had, we, yeah, no, we're like, it's, we're not skipping any segments. If we are here for an hour and a half, we're doing it. Now we're moving into the true or false because we're doing it. Okay. True or false. It's the time for another game where we play with my co-hosts and now we have three so there's even more competition um and i present my co-host with 10 true or false statements they have to tell me if these are true or false statements today's theme is cncf um the ticker code is going across the bottom three eight seven nine five seven zero i'm sure someone will drop that in chat for me um and i'm going to bring it up and we're ready to go so go ahead and join and we're gonna do it again this week if you're one of the winners and you're not one of my co-hosts, if you're the top winner, you will get <laughs> you will get a Sammy sticker pack because my co-hosts have enough because I've shipped them a lot of stickers. <laughs> Kim's particularly just got like 200 of every sticker we have. So I got a lot of stickers. <laughs> so everyone join in real quick. Um, and if you win, you'll get a Sammy sticker pack, which will be fun. And a reminder for people in chat, uh, if you want to be competitive about this, YouTube is the best place to watch the stream um, to get minimal stream delay. Yes, does have the least amount of stream delay that we've seen. Uh, my co-hosts also will reserve time, like they, so they won't answer immediately because we're trying to not like the goal is for them not to win. Um, so uh, yes, Ricardo, if you win, you can win again, and your stuff has shipped. So let me know when you get it, please. Email me back. Because I did ship it through CODIS and it, I did get a confirmation of shipment. If so, win, our we'll backstage, I'm going to really quickly ask our backstage person is making a grimacing face. Is that for us? Okay, good. I was just, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, did we do something wrong? Um, okay, I'm going to give you another 15 seconds before we go off. Uh, remember, you can win. You can win some stickers if you jump in now. Yeah, do the thing again where like, you say 15 seconds and then someone joins and you say another 15 seconds. Well, it didn't work this time. We're still at 12. I'll, I'll give it five more seconds. Come on. You can do it. Oh, there's Bolina. There we go. See, they always come in. Move. Yeah. I, I need you to sit in three, you know, two and a half, <laughs> two. <laughs> yeah, it works, doesn't it? Okay. I think we're going to go ahead and go. I think even if you start, you can still come in. And if Matt does terribly bad, you can still beat him. So... <laughs> First oh, question, pickers, right? Today's true or false CNCF edition. This is going to be fun. Hopefully I did it all right. True or false. 
CNCF stands for Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Does CNCF stand for Cloud Native Computing Foundation? Is this the music from uh, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? It's like music Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. It's the it's the <laughs> public domain version of that. Ah. And this is true. CNCF stands for Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Who's coming up? Vim for life. Okay. It's a great wow. name. Matt? <laughs> Okay, here we go. Next question. The CNCF is a Linux Foundation project. Is this true or is this false? The CNCF is a Linux Foundation project. Ooh. Oh, gosh. Which came first, the Linux Foundation or the CNCF? <laughs> right, yeah. I'm going to remove the overlay real quick because it's blocking the question. Sounds so. good. Yeah, we'll deal with that. Overlays are new this week. This is true. It is a Linux Foundation project. Oh, Paul's coming up. Maurice, Matt, Leo. Next question. A true. portion of the internet is Linux Foundation. <laughs> yeah. Less than 10 projects have graduated from the CNCF. Is this true or is this false? Oh, I was looking at this last week. Yeah, less than 10 projects have graduated. That doesn't mean that they're a part of it. It means that they've graduated from it. They're full projects. That means something. I didn't get a chance to look all that up. So, This is false. There are currently 15 projects mm. that have graduated from the CNCF project, and I'm not going to list them all because there's a lot. <laughs> there's a page on the CNCF site for it. Yes, there is. Oh, Paul's holding up. Next question. The inspiration for Kubernetes comes from a Google's Google project whose name is inspired by Star Wars. I got a little Star Wars gift there. The <laughs> inspiration for Kubernetes comes from a Google project whose name is inspired by Star Wars. Is this true or is this false? Do you want to know? This is false. Kubernetes co does come from a Google project, but it comes from the Google project Borg, which is inspired from the Seven of Nine Borg from Star Trek not Next Generation, Voyager, Star Trek Voyager. That was Jerry Ryan and Kate Mulhausen. Uh -huh. Next question. Kubernetes is less than 10 years old. Is Kubernetes less than 10 years old? True or false? Are you liking my pictures? <laughs> that cake does look good. <laughs> yeah, I saw <laughs> Like, very perfect cake. <laughs> ah, good. Most people got this. This is true. So if you see a job requirement that wants greater than 10 years Kubernetes experience, run for the hills because they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> oh, salt is strong today. Paul, you're doing great. <laughs> Next question. Sorry, I hit the music a little bit early. Kubernetes runs in less than half of container environments. Does Kubernetes run in less than half of con all containerized application environments? This is true. This is false. Kubernetes runs in less than half of container environments. I can't let there be silence. There's no reason for silence. <laughs> you use Nick. I know, you're right. I can't hear the music, remember? Like, oh, yes, you are sitting in awkward silence. Yes, I'm sitting in awkward silence. Kubernetes runs in less than half of all container environments. This is false. Oh, wow. crossing, crossing the gap in mid-2020, Kubernetes mm -hmm. runs in more than half of all container environments. So if you're running, a con if you're running an orchestrator, you're 50, 50, greater than 50% chance it's Kubernetes related. Or there is at least Kubernetes in your environment. Mm -hmm. Next question. More than 25% of containers deployed are using less than 10% of the requested amount of CPU. I got to do that math. Hold on. It's actually, so are more than 25% of the deployed containers using less than 10% of their requested? So that would be like me saying, I want four CPUs and I'm using less than 10% of four CPUs. I am guilty of this. Everyone oh, no. got that one. I'm great. <laughs> you all did get it and you all still do it. You know you don't need that much CPU and you're still doing it. Yes, so many people think and this I, I used to, I've seen this problems when people spin up VMs and droplets too is like you think you need eight eight cores and eight gigs of RAM to host your single static site on Nginx that three people visit a year. No you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> okay? No you don't. 
So, yes. <sighs> anyway, man, I'm being spicy. To Paul, okay, how's Paul doing this? This is great. Did they... Seven straight answers, and we're on seven. Are we going to get a perfect score? Next question. More than 50% of all containers have a lifespan of greater than two weeks. Is this true or is this false? More than 50% of all containers have a lifespan of greater than two weeks. I know mine don't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. False. Only 37% of containers have a lifespan of greater than two weeks. 37%. 37%. I wonder how they get all this data. Yeah, where does this data come <laughs> this, from? This, a, a lot of this data comes from uh, Sysdig and Datadog. Uh, oh. and all, of, and all of their polls and stuff. So like these are professional companies doing these polls. Um, obviously, it can't be 100% accurate because not everybody answered the poll, but Man. more than half of Kubernetes clusters contain less than five nodes. I'm doing terrible today. Same. <laughs> More than half of Kubernetes clusters contain less than five nodes. Contains five or uh, five or less nodes. I can't type. True. Uh, yes, that is. Did I write anything about that to talk about? Sixty percent of of clusters contain one to five nodes. Okay. Oh, did Paul? Okay, well, it doesn't say that Paul's on a. We'll see. Still going though. Kubernetes is written in Golang. True or false? <laughs> Look at that cute gopher. <laughs> it's a gopher, yes. That is a gopher. <laughs> Kubernetes is written in the Golang programming language. True or false? This is true. That's just, no, that's it. That's true. That's it. Seven out of ten. Kim, okay. Okay, you stay for the out, job. Eight out of ten. Maurice, number one. Nine out of ten. So there wasn't a perfect score. Wow. Paul, okay. Wow. Very good. That is very good. So, Paul, if you would email mason at do.co or mason at digitalocean.com, I will send you some stickers. I will also put it in the chat. There you go. So, email me and I will send you some stickers. Unless this is Paulina, in which case you work for us and you don't get them. <laughs> in that so case, Paul, Maurice. In that case, Maurice. I don't, I don't is, that, is that Paulina? I can't tell. Maurice, send us an email as well. I'm send sure me an we email as well. <laughs> yeah, we can figure it out. Send us an Kim, email. If you, and, want, if you want more stickers, yeah, you know. Yeah. No, no more stickers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, send us an email and in the email include your your shipping address so I can ship it to you. So, oh no, Paul was Polina. Ah, Polina, Maurice, you're the winner. Pauli okay, one, Polina, are you a secret CNCF person? Because <laughs> nine out of ten is amazing. That's, That's very um, good. <laughs> yeah. So thank you, Polina. Uh, Maurice, you are the winner. Send us an email and we'll send you some stickers. And that's all we have for true or false today let's put the banners back up and now we're going to another segment that we love very dearly which is back in my day it's a segment that we do where we talk about some of the marvelous things that have happened in tech in history uh and we're going to be doing this segment now once a month and we're going to talk about all the things in history that have happened in the month of may so looking back here we go you've got mail <laughs> Still the best sound effect I've ever made in my life. Yep. <laughs> uh, Chris, are you going to be uh, showing? Yep, coming online. Sweet. May 3rd, 1984. The Dell Computer Foundation, founded by Michael Dell. Give Chris a second. I'm waiting. Yeah. Oh. You'll get it. Oh, we don't need the Kahoot banner anymore. Yeah. Oh, someone got it. Hooray. There we go. Yeah. yeah, Michael Dell runs this, and now Dell PCs. I mean, you may be used to them in the consumer line, but they are what most uh, servers, most servers are running Dell. Um, I'm in Austin, Texas. Dell's found is in Round Rock, which is like five miles north of. Uh, it's basically Austin. Mm -hmm. um, my little brother went to UT at the Bill Gates and Michael Dell Computer Science Building. Oh. Um, yeah. 
yeah, they 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 sneezed and a building appeared. Um, <laughs> Because UT is like a really, really good computer science school. So, yeah, there yeah. you go. Yeah, wow. Our, long time our, ago. Long time ago. It's hard to believe. 1984. Our next one is on May 5th, 1961. Oh, I didn't do the transition. You've got mail. The transition. <laughs> uh, the first American in space, NASA astronaut Alan Shepard, becomes the first astronaut in space, uh, makes the 15 minute suborbital flight in the Mercury capsule Freedom 7. He reaches an altitude of 115 miles, during which he experiences about five minutes of weightlessness. So that was the first American to ever experience weightlessness. I wonder, I wonder how you get back and describe that. Well, presumably, like, like there've been people prior to that that experienced it, like for a very short time period on Earth. Like if you go bungee jumping or whatever. But yeah, first time experience properly proper zero g. Yeah. Yeah. Closest I've gotten is a uh, trampoline. <laughs> Same. <laughs> have y'all have y'all ever wanted to do those things where you go up in the airplane and then it comes down? Basically, it's a, it's a simulated crash where you're just free falling. Well, they call um, that the vomit comet. The, the yeah. vomit comet. Yes. <laughs> no, no. Based on that name, I'm not interested. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness i don't know i think before i die i would want i would want to experience zero g i think it's something that would be interesting um mm -hmm. hopefully whenever i experience zero g it would be it will be uh by my choice not being <laughs> not being yeeted into space by the planet so i don't know i feel like commercial space flights are coming along nicely it is yeah. really interesting i like i wonder when we're going to get to go to the hotel on the moon like mm -hmm. it's gonna if that be... even becomes a thing I mean, I think there's people working on it, Matt. Yeah, I don't know. Like, it always it, it, it's interesting to me. Like, at what point is like strict regulation going to come in? We'll see. I don't know. Yeah. Hopefully, we can get up there before and just wild west it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, our next, our next story is that. Linus Torvalds adopts Tux the penguin as the mascot on May 9th, nineteen ninety six. So for those of you that love the adorable little penguin, it was officially adopted as the Linux mascot on May 9th, 1996. Or like the nod to happy feet. <laughs> was that the first, was Tux the first like cute animal tech logo slash mascot? Because now we have Sammy the shark and Octocat. And... So I don't know. Um, I can't think of one. FreeBSD has Beastie. Oh yeah, you're right. Which I don't know how old that logo is. Um, so Beastie was the cute little devil, and I don't know <laughs> if that counts as an animal. Um, but yeah, they had that. That's the only one that I can think of that would have been around that time. I mean, like Postgres has the elephant, but is that really a cute little animal or just a silhouette? You know. Sure. <laughs> and then, like, I guess PHP's elephant. How long has mm -hmm. that been around? The BSD demon was first drawn in 1976. Ooh. Okay, so well, it's has, old. Has Linux beat by 20 years? <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Our next story is on May 10th, 1894. Mail. I can't say that. G Giglielmo Macro Marconi, oh my goodness, sends a radio wave three quarters of a mile. This becomes radio and be the mm. birth of the wireless everything so you know from like orson wells terrifying people with league of <laughs> with war of the worlds to now i can send cat pictures through via bluetooth to anybody who walks within a perimeter using airdrop we've got it all don't we yep. we do so congratulate we have the we have wireless oh that's nice okay bsd first showed up in a book cover on 1988 88 according to yeah this one Sweet. Awesome. And our last one we have today, You've probably one of mail. the most important ones, is on May 17th, 1991, the World Wide Web launched. First ever web server set up by Tim Ber uh, Berners-Lee on a Next Cube at CERN. And I believe you can actually still visit the original website. I think someone has preserved it. So, yeah. We launched the internet 20 years ago. Internet's 20 years old as of a couple days ago. And I'm sure in the history books will be wildly considered one of the worst things we've ever done. 
<laughs> so, worst and best, yes. <laughs> worst and best. So unlimited access to knowledge. We watch TikTok. So hey, TikTok's good stuff. It is good stuff. That's why I watch it so much. <laughs> Okay, uh, that's all we have for back in my day. We're going to go ahead and move on to our last segment of the day, which is what's on your mind. This is the segment where we just go around and we talk about what's on our mind. And as usual, we stop. We start with the person with no face, Matt. <laughs> so this week, I mentioned it earlier, um, JavaScript bundling has had another bit of awesome news. Um, Parcel, which is kind of not just a JavaScript bundler, it kind of does your full it bundles your full site so if you ever use webpack you'll know that kind of it webpacks very specifically targets javascript um and making it deal with html is kind of a bit of pain uh parcel you give it an entry point that is an html file and it bundles everything loaded from that file uh, so it's kind of a i don't know i prefer it as a tool um and in their latest beta release they've rewritten their compiler in rust and it's 10 times faster <laughs> uh, and it now like ranks pretty high up uh, in like ES builds uh, bundler ranking um, ES build being a go based bundler off the top of my head um, which has like performance comparisons now for all the main bundlers so yeah I don't know this is just really cool um, there you go there's, there's the numbers um, it's much faster ow yeah that is much pretty better neat. when you show me bars <laughs> Bar, bars bars go burr yes yeah. I know, I'm looking forward to playing around with this beta and uh, actually seeing it be this fast in production. Yeah, that would where, be does, pretty cool. where does uh, like Vite sit in this list? Uh, I don't actually know. Um, also, like, does I don't know? It's a separate question to that. Does Vite sit in this list at all? Um, yeah, I, I'm not entirely sure myself. Because but... last time I feel like this conversation came up a little while ago on Hacker News. Um, and Evan himself got involved in the conversation said Vite is not intended to be a bundler. <laughs> it just happens to do that as part of its process. I remember that. I think we talked about that on another Cloud Chats. I feel like we did at some point in the past. Um, yeah. I can't remember the context, though. It must have been another bundler. <laughs> yeah. Parcel's really cool. Um, if you're building static front-end sites, I recommend playing around with it. It's a really nice way to cool. bundle everything. Yeah, I gotta go look at that um, rankings list and like where Webpack Five runs. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what's on my mind this week, really. Cool. Chris, over to you. Yeah, um, I had text editors in here, but looks like we've exhausted that topic a little bit today. <laughs> um, so I threw in another one, just a fun tool that I saw this week, Fig.io, where it gives you autocomplete for your terminal. Ooh. Like. Actually, really good looking autocomplete. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. um, that's on my mind. Yeah. I, I, I've been using ZSH's autocomplete plugin, but it's nowhere near as cool as this. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, I remember seeing some conversation about this. If I remember correctly, right, this is closed source and they're trying to commercialize it. Oh, I didn't get that far into it, but it looks like. I mean, you'll see. <laughs> Maybe it's not close. I don't know. I saw some comments online, online about it, like they're trying to commercialize it or something, which seemed really bizarre. Well, I mean, it's right but maybe that here. was wrong. So maybe, yeah. By the way, it looks like a really cool tool, um, and I want to play around with it. Yeah, I had to throw my name in, but I don't know. These beta early access email things and wait lists, it's taken too long. <laughs> I don't, it, still wait, it, waiting on open AI. It looks it, I don't know. In some part of my brain's going, it breaks the fourth wall here. <laughs> it's it's a na it looks like a very native pop up in a terminal shell. Are you for or against? I don't know where to sit. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Uh, yeah. All right, Kim. All right, my Thing that's been on my mind is also like terminal enhancement. Um, so I've been hearing a lot about this project called Lip Gloss um, from a company called Charm Bracelet. And I guess it's like being able to uh, use like CSS uh, for your oh. terminal, essentially. Um, so 
I don't know, the company seems pretty cool. They have a lot of open source projects that are written in Go, um, or you can create fun and like colorful terminals. So I want to check it out. So it, does it sit on top of, like, is it their own terminal? I don't think so. I think it's yours. <laughs> Yeah, this looks cool. Like if you can yeah. do stuff like this. Uh, this seems like a lot of um, color code magic to make a terminal <laughs> do this. Yeah. Um, great for conference talks though. Yeah. Oh, that's a good call. Yeah. Yeah, and they have some other projects that are uh, specifically for creating like terminal games or tutorials. So I'd like to check those out as well. But yeah, I don't know. yeah, this looks really cool. Um, terminal magic always blows me away because oh, I still, in my mind, terminal is still just a plain text thing, and then people do this. And I'm like, cool. Yeah, I see like Webpack throws in a little progress bar now, and I'm like, that's amazing. Yeah, how do you do that? <laughs> I have no idea. I'm trying to find palette eight. Aiden says uh, palettes, but I can't really see him. It's all good though. Well, if you can't find palettes, I would say that's a lot of documentation in a README. I like that. <laughs> that is a lot of documentation. Uh, I, I, I imagine from that README, you can you know everything you need to know to use this. Yeah, it looks good. <laughs> that's awesome. All um, right, Mason. Sorry, Ken. Oh, no worries. <laughs> Mason, you're, you're up. <laughs> Yes, as always, I don't have tech things on my mind. Um, one day I will, not today. Yesterday was two years. Oh, of, Loki! <laughs> of time with this little this little chocolate chunk. I got him when he was eight weeks old. This is Loki, everyone. This is my chocolate lab, and I've just been thinking a lot about him because I'm gonna go. I'm going out for the weekend, and I have to leave him with some friends, and I'm going to miss him. But, uh, but yes, this is this is the Loki. <laughs> and he um as he's a labrador and he worries a lot of pounds <laughs> um, and he doesn't like when i do that so dude, dude, dude you're calm you're you're good you're good dude you're good i used to be able to pick like he used to be this big and now he's that big so and now he thinks i want to play so he's gonna bug me for the rest of the show ah uh, well but That's i've been thinking it. about that and the other thing i've been thinking about is chris and i have been talking about just like challenging each other to write an ebook in two weeks and i'm thinking about what i want to write about <laughs> anybody yeah. want to join <laughs> i've thought about it i don't well, know what i want yeah. <laughs> yeah i think i'd probably write about some django stuff i think that would be pretty fun like i've done a lot of i've done a lot of python programming i do a lot of terraform but i'm actually working on that as a separate book otherwise so i don't okay. want to write i don't want to write an ebook to compete with my other my other book so yeah i don't know i've been wanting to get more into like external content creation and i finally feel like i'm i have the i feel like i have the energy to do it outside of work which is nice because for a long time it's like after work and then just <laughs> dead yeah, it, can be, so. it can be hard to tech after a tech job <laughs> it is it is I, a lot of the times i'm like i just want to go to sleep and not have to worry about things or watch game of thrones <laughs> um Build a trebuchet with Mark Rober. I don't know. Like, <laughs> yes. That is a good way to end the day. <laughs> right? It is. So that's what's been on my mind. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. And I think we're just wrapping up now, closing off with the last of our segments. Next is upcoming events. So uh, DockerCon is today. Virtual and free registration. You can still attend. Uh, Kim and myself will be staffing the Digital Ocean virtual booth from 1 to 3 Central, I believe. So that's, right. what is that, 2 to 4, 2, two to 5 EST? Um, I don't know. I don't know time zones. Uh, so if you want to attend to DockerCon, just Google DockerCon. The conference is going on all day today, and you'll be able to come and say and hang out with Kim and I. Um, our next thing is on June 1st, leveraging partnerships as a small startup will be a tech talk that DigitalOcean is doing. Um, a small, a small startup can gain access to large audience by, of users by leveraging a technology partnership with a larger, more established company. Contentful, Cloudflare, and Ninetail.io discuss 
how each side thinks about technology partnerships and how to build out a program to scale partnerships. So, yeah, that sounds pretty neat. That sounds pretty interesting, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Then the day after that on June 2nd is using Prisma with Postgres. Let's build a Node API with Chris. Chris, what do we got there? Yeah, so Prisma, really fun tool that just came out of beta, uh, pretty much ORM for Node scenarios. So we'll build uh, an API on top of Node and Postgres. Nice. Sweet. That's going to yeah. be pretty fun. And then finally, we can talk about it because we've been discussing it internally for a while now. Um, Deploy.digitalocean.com. Do we want to pull up that site? Yeah, I'm on it. Yeah. So DigitalOcean's Deploy Conference is coming back. We're having another one on June 29th. Power your business. So if you want to build a tech business, this is the conference for you. We're going to have speakers. I'm pretty sure all of us in this chat are going to be speaking about various things that we can't tell you about yet because <laughs> we like we like creating arbitrary surprises for no reason. Also, we want you to go to the website and figure it out yourself. Yes. Yeah. So go to the website, RSVP for DigitalOcean Deploy for Deploy 21 for Power Your Business. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think yeah. about what I can say, but that's it. Yeah, we'll go with that. Yay! Conference. Yeah. Okay, I think we're all we're all going to be there. Um, there will also speakers. there will also be that week, the week of June 29th. Cloud chats will be on Tuesday, and it will be a live from deploy cloud chats. So we will oh, yeah, be doing do a deploy a special deploy cloud chats. Our normal Thursday block. We will probably not have one. We haven't discussed not having one yet, but if we want to do two in a week, we can. Uh, that's sure. something for our backstage manager to figure out um, <laughs> or for us to discuss in our next meeting. So yes, come and join us at DigitalOcean Deploy. There's going to be Discord and, well, Discord servers. Discord, saying there's going to be Discord sounds like it's a negative thing. Um, <laughs> there will be fighting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, Yes, we there'll, be, there'll be a Discord server for people to join and chat in as well and everything. Yeah. Yes, you'll be able to hang out with us all day. We we've already blocked off our entire day of doing nothing but hanging out with y'all at the conference, and we hope to see you there. Yeah. Um. So the next thing we're going to talk about, I don't know if we have a thing for it today, but we're going to talk about where you can find us. What if you want to hear more from Chris, Kim, Matt, and myself? Well, if you've noticed, our well, are you going to type them in, Chris, or are we going to use yeah. our name? Well, oh, Chris can type them, and they're still on the side as well. Yeah, I don't know. They just look really small on my screen. Okay, anyway, find us on Twitter. We're all on Twitter and follow us. If you haven't noticed our little name things, like shut up, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> our little name things are our Twitter handles. So if you want to find us and you want to follow us, come give us a follow. There's lots of places. Chris does lots of cool stuff on YouTube. Look him up. Yeah. Um, I do less cool things on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, this is how you can find us. If you want to tweet at us, if you want to just hear the crazy things, if you want to get notifications about when we're going live again, and you all, like we usually post about like whenever we do our own personal streams and all of that stuff. Yeah. Also, yeah. let us know what other things you'd like to see from the show. Um, you can message all of us on Twitter and we'll incorporate it into the show. Yeah, so just keep tweeting at us until we do it. <laughs> it's the same strategy. <laughs> It does. It works. And we're, we're always looking for new things for the show. So we're, we're open to any and all ideas. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Well, I think finally, all we have left is the joke of the day. It's the best part of the day in my mind. And I think that they're going to, I think you're going to like it. And if you don't, well, then you just don't like fun. Wow. So, that's really hyping up this week's joke. <laughs> it's a good joke. <laughs> How do trees use a computer? How? They log in. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> that's so far. <laughs> okay. I'm glad you like it, Matt. I'm glad that I, I got Kim to laugh and Chris hates me. So we did a good job. So awesome. Mason, well, I just judge everything off of the stroganoff joke. Um, the stroganoff joke was good. I'm sorry that one was so good. I, I <laughs> started. You peaked. You, you peaked I, pe early. I pe peaked at stroganoff. That one was funny. I'm uh, like I have a whole spreadsheet of these. I'm gonna have to fill them in. Do you know how fun it is to put in your Jira ticket and tell your boss I need an hour this week to write jokes? <laughs> like <laughs> it's pretty funny. Oh. 
Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. That's all we have time for Cloud Chats today. We only went over by 15 minutes, which I think is a miracle, seeing as how we didn't get out of news until 45 minutes in. Yeah, um, that was impressive. That was impressive. We booked through this, and hopefully you'll come <laughs> back next week and see us again. Great seeing everyone, and have a good week. Have a good If you're in the U.S., have a good Memorial Day weekend, and we will see you next week. See you Bye, next everybody. Week. <laughs> yeah.